Hey horror fans, welcome back to Room 237, coming at you with another review, and I'm continuing my reviews of the Hammer films, specifically the Hammer Frankenstein series, with the fourth film, Frankenstein Created Woman. Which of course, this is a Screen Factory release, which comes with this new artwork slipcover. That's how it comes normally. But I'm, I'm always a stickler for original covers, so I like this one better. <laughs> so, this is the fourth film in the series. Came out in 1967, th three years after Evil of Frankenstein. Uh, returning to the director's chair is Terrence Fisher, the big hammer director, who did not who directed the first two, not the last one. And of course, the ever loyal Peter Cushing as Baron Frankenstein. Which, since he's again Baron Frankenstein, I'm, I could be wrong on this, but I believe this and the rest of them are following continuity of evil of Frankenstein. Okay, so at the end of of revenge, he, you know, faked his death twice, changed his name to Dr. Frank, Dr. Stein, or vice versa. And now he's just back to Baron Frankenstein. Because Evil was kind of a loose reboot, not as much as Horror of Frankenstein, but still kind of like a reboot. Basically, because they got the rights to make the monster look like uh, Universal's. So I could be wrong, but I believe it's following the evil of Frankenstein continuity. Also, you have uh, Susan Denberg as you know, uh, uh, the woman character is Christina Cleave, but she put, she becomes his creation. I don't know if she was at the time, but she, she's a Playboy model. I don't know what else she's been in. I don't know if she's done any other Hammer films. Which this cover is kind of misleading because she doesn't really kill. It's scantily, you know, scantily clad. There's not like a scientific tomb of water to resurrect her. <clears throat> a beautiful woman with the soul of the devil. Now, this, this movie has, it's been criticized quite a bit for its script and its really outlandish story. I actually enjoyed it. I, I actually really liked this movie. The script... Yeah, kind of hokey. Uh, the acting really isn't that great. Apart from, you know, of course, Cushing is great, as always. And Thorley Walters, if I'm pronouncing that right, as uh, Dr. Hertz. They did great. Which, I mean, Peter Cushing, when is he not great? Susan Denberg, I mean, she did all right. But after she becomes the creation, kind of playing the whole, who am I? Where did I come from? A little over the top. And this series really has a thing for naming his young assistants Hans. Because he has another Hans in this film. It is a different Hans. This time he's played by Robert Morris. And... The story is, <clears throat> it opens up with this criminal being led to the guillotine, uh, convicted of murder, and just as he's getting to the guillotine, a young boy walks up and yells Papa as the blade falls, and we hear the man say his name, Hans. <laughs> so then we get to present day, or at least when this takes place. Hans is a young, smart, well-to-do, well-reliable assistant to 
Frankenstein and Dr. Hertz. And I will say it's a bit outlandish, but it doesn't get as weird as it sounds. I, I thought for what it is, it they did well with it. The first film, he was trying to create life from assorted parts. Second film, he was trying to create life to certain parts, like they're all, the parts by themselves. Of course, with a brain for both of them. Then this one, he's not trying to bring life from body, brain, or body parts. He's trying to capture and transplant the soul. Which sounds silly, sounds stupid. I wasn't really into the idea. I thought, you know, mad scientists working with stolen dead bodies, stolen body parts, that's cool. Soul is getting into supernatural, which is not really what I'm into. But I thought they did it well. Or the execution of it and how it played out. Um, they feel, and he has like these satellite dishes and there's, I mean, it's hammer. So the effects are kind of going to be a little cheap and cheesy, but I like that. I love hammer for that. He has like these satellite dishes and just some lights really. And he does it at Dr. Hertz's house, which <clears throat> feels more like a little country home than anything. It doesn't really look like a lab. But they feel like they have a, a breakthrough. So they send Hans down to, I think, like a tavern to get some wine. And at the tavern, you have a, a Mr. Cleave, played by Alan McNaughton, and his daughter, Christina, played by Susan Denberg. Hans is in love with Christina, but she's horribly disfigured. It's like pink and purple discoloration and like big scars. But he's in love with her. She's always hiding her face. Cleve doesn't want him to be around her, which is kind of weird. A guy, like, show, she's deformed, feels bad about herself. He's showing her genuine love and affection. He, he's telling him to fuck off, basically. But while he's there, these three stereotypical uh, teddy boys walk in. If you don't know what a teddy boy is, uh, it's like the rich, well-dressed, like top hat and cane, kind of pretty much like the Rolling Stones in the 60s. Or a uh, teddy boy was a term in the 60s. They come in and they start some trouble. They harass Christina. Hans fights all three of them, grabs a knife, cuts the leader, Anton, in the face. And Anton is played by, I don't know any of these actors, P Peter Blythe. That actually sounds familiar. Film and television. A Challenge for Robin Hood, which is a Hammer film. That and this was only two Hammer films. I haven't seen... His most successful film was something called Carrington in the 90s, so I don't know him. <laughs> Anton's the leader. Then there's uh, Carl, played by Barry Warren, and Johan, played by Derek... Folds, 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 whatever. And even when Cleve takes the knife away from him when the constables arrive, he says, I'll kill you for this. He ends up going with Christina. They spend the night together. The boys go back, drink more wine. Actually, they're going to steal the wine. Cleve comes in. They... They, they beat him to death, but I was kind of confused if 
they knew it was him and chose to do it or if they thought he was Hans because there's a look of shock when they stop and they look at him. And Hertz had given Hans his overcoat because it was cold. So the cops are trying to get Hans, especially since they, everyone in the village knows who he and his father was. He won't tell anyone he was with Christina for whatever reason. And he gets sentenced to death by guillotine. Christina goes to stop it. She's too late. She drowns herself because she's, you know, guilty and distraught. And so that's when Frankenstein and Hertz, they take Hans's head and they take Christina's body. They, they restore her body and put his soul into her. When she wakes up, you know, her face is fixed. She has blonde hair. It was red before. And, like, she has no memory of who she is. Frankenstein doesn't want to tell her, but Hertz is really, you know, sweet to her. And tr treats her more like a human than a test subject, like Frankenstein does. And eventually, the soul of Hertz... Hertz... Hans talks to her and, you know, uh, commands her to kill the three boys. And that's the movie. And I, it is kind of slow, but the thing I like most about this movie is it brought an element of tragedy back to Frankenstein. Which, granted, the, the tragedy is in Hans. And you do kind of root for Christina as she's killing those three guys. Because they are perfect at being assholes. Like, they really make him out to be jerk-offs. But, you know, Hans's character was tragic. And then... You know, his soul is put into this other body and commands the body to kill. It just, it had, even though it's different than the tragedy in the first two Karloff, James Whale films, it's a different kind of tragedy, but still an element of tragedy, which is perfect for gothic horror. Other than that, it was it's really just Peter Cushing's performance that really makes the film and he kind of takes a back seat in this you know it's mostly uh, Susan Denberg it's more so her movie I would even say Hertz has a little bit more to do sometimes than Frankenstein does and but of course he's still just the workaholic bad scientist sociopath like, when Hans is sentenced to death, instead of trying to make a case, like, he could have done it, we have to save him, he's more like, oh, great, perfect. Uh, it's a body we can work with. Thought we'd have to wait years for this opportunity, but here it is. Also, just, he's arrogant and, like, a low-key, just charming Peter Cushing kind of way. Like, during Hans' trial, he's saying what he's a doctor of. And then one of the boys, Wisecrack's like, at witchcraft. And he's like, well, there are no accolades for witchcraft, but if there is, then I, I am up for one. Or, like, at the end, the cops are like, after he explains what's going on, they're like, do you take us for fools? He's just like, yes. And then continues what he's saying. Just that low-key shade that Cushing is just phenomenal with and even though like it really feels like Frankenstein is underplayed in this film but since it's Peter Cushing he really just he makes the best of it S same with Karloff when he played the monster or any character like Karloff in uh, the old dark house from 1931 he uh was the old house 31? 31 or 35? I think it was 31. 
<coughs> he had barely anything to do with that movie, but he still made the character a character. And that's what Peter Cushing did in this. He's still phenomenal to watch. He's a he's a very entertaining, just class, just a classy actor. I really like that uh, Thorley Walters as Dr. Hertz. I thought he did a great job. But yeah, uh, Barry Warren. Was it Barry Warren as Hans? I think that's what I said. You know, there is some overacting. I will give it that. And yeah, the script wasn't as good as it could have been. But for taking a concept like, oh, we're going to try to capture and transplant the soul in this very famous Mad Scientist series, it, I, personally, I thought it went better than anything else it could have been. Because it's very downplayed, the, the soul part. Like, she even has Hans's head on, like, posts of this vanity mirror. And it's like she talks to it and she hears his voice. It made more sense than the idea does itself. So I appreciated that. But yeah, the movie did not really do well when it came out. Um... I mean, I guess one accolade, or not really accolade, but like uh, Scorsese has cited it as one of his favorite films because of, you know, he liked the idea of isolating the soul. Um, it's not quite as gory as some people would make it out to be or have said. I mean, I've seen gorier Hammer films. <clears throat> Originally... Um, this was supposed to be the direct follow-up to Revenge of Frankenstein. Back in, in, in 58, they had planned on it. And it was going to be called... Uh, and, then, and then Frankenstein created a woman. Because there was a French film by uh, uh, Roger Vadim called... A Dieu... Crea la femme, which translates, if I said it right, A God Created Woman. It was a successful film. But it just kept getting delayed and more ideas were coming along that were easier to sell. But it went into production on July 4th, 1966. This was through, this is one of the Bray Studios film. Because there was a period where Bray Studios was doing all the hammer stuff. But, I mean, even it's pacing for what kind of movie this is. I uh, I enjoyed it. I, I think I even liked it more than uh, A Revenge of Frankenstein. Just, I mean, I would say Peter Cushing's performance and just the element of tragedy, I think, really made this movie. But, yeah, so that is the fourth film, Hammer Frankenstein series. There's two more. I plan on getting back to Dracula and the rest of my uh, um, Universal films as well. But yeah, 1967's Frankenstein Created Woman. Thank you for watching.